This book talk features senior fellow Anya Kasperson interviewing Artificial Intelligence and Equality Initiative Advisory Board member Kobe Lanes about her book, New War Technologies and International Law, The Legal Limits to Weaponizing Nanomaterials. It was recorded on May 13th, 2022. So Kobe, welcome. Congratulations on your book. It is an absolutely fascinating and sobering read. And I'm always intrigued by the opening line of a book, which in my experience often speaks to the core motivation behind writing it. And you write in your opening line, and I quote, the desire for humanity and the desire for security have coexisted as long as humans have been alive. As science has become increasingly sophisticated, so have the methods of self-defense by states. And if I understand the core premise of the book correctly, it intends to explain those methods as well as why it is important to connect the different legal regimes and cross fertilize ideas to ensure that the protection needed is adequately provided by international law. So to get us started, tell us more about what motivated you to write this book beyond the quote that I just provided. Why now? And perhaps also, who is it for? It's a lot of questions to unpack. Thanks, Anya. Thanks. Thanks for having me here. The purpose of the book really came out of attending a series of conferences where I saw presentations on various types of technologies. And at the end, there would always be just a, like a last small session on quantum, cyber, and nano. And they would sort of be scooted over. They wouldn't be talked about deeply. And I became really curious because I was reading articles about brain human interaction and research that was being done, but I couldn't get any information on what the laws were that would be applying to some of those technologies. So I decided a little bit crazily to go into a deep dive into those technologies and to really provide a case study if you like in the same way that you need to do a weapons review for those who don't know that if you acquire or modify a weapon you need to review it basically these are three examples of weapons that if you were to use them this is what you would need to consider so not to gloss over not to go through it quickly but to actually really contemplate which laws would apply because i kept hearing there's no law there's no law there's no law and there is law um, and I wanted to really frame it in a way that was accessible. The motivation from a personal level is really deep in that I grew up with a parent who went through a war and I'm really conscious of the effects of war and disarmament is something that's very, very close to my heart. So I also wanted this to be something that was a powerful and useful tool, not just a, an academic tone. Technology neutral policy or political neutral technology, depending on how you view it, both perhaps useful and temptuous uh, concepts used, but treacherous concepts nevertheless, that have led many politicians, policymakers, and technology leaders into making core decisions about important technology issues over the past decade. What are your views on this? I think the communication between the scientists and the policymakers has not been strong enough. There, there needs to be a better communication and a better understanding of where the technologies are at. But this goes to a broader issue, which I touch on many times in the book, which is we've siloed all of these different areas of knowledge. And knowledge wasn't always this way, but over the time we've picked different subjects and we've separated them and we've decided that they're not connected. But we actually need to be connecting those dots. So just to give a really specific example, having attended a defence conference where someone, someone was actually researching how to uh, prohibit enzyme functions in the human body and I spoke to the scientist on the side and I said you know have you thought about how this would be used and he was like no it's, just, it's really interesting research so the connection goes both ways that the leaders are not necessarily thinking about how the science will be used the scientists are not necessarily thinking what are the risks in this development not just direct risks but how could this potentially be misused how could there be dual use that this could be used for another purpose that is not intended so I think that communication and finding a, a joint language so that those sorts of information flows could be better is really, really important. And you just alluded to dual use, um, and it, it, which is a, sometimes a bit of a misnomer, right? And others have been using omni-use or even dual capability technologies. So before we dive into the nano aspects of your book, can mm -hmm. you explain to our listeners what is meant by that term and why it is also problematic from an international legal point of view? Yeah, absolutely. So beyond the first sentence of humanity and security have always existed, I then go on to tell a story of one of the oldest skulls that is found. And the skull has no teeth or is worn down, has very worn down teeth. So this is an indication that this person was elderly, but there are also weapons nearby. So there's this, again, this sort of historically 
this link between science, the same science that was used to potentially provide for someone who was vulnerable was also potentially, which in this case was a rock or a stone, was used to protect, you know, protect the people. So again, these sciences, as if we develop things, any kind of tool, it's always got the dual use. When we say dual use, it just means it can be used in many different ways. So any kind of substance in a particular quantity is enough to cause harm. Any kind of technology used in a certain way, even the most harmless thing can be harmful. So looking around and seeing the world through the lens of how could this potentially be misused? What would be misused? And we've had instances of that when we were in New York, we've had you know, moments no one thought planes could be weaponized. Any kind of technology can be weaponized. Thinking about what those risks are in that technology inherently, even if those risks are small, the impacts can be huge if they are misused, but some are quite obviously able to be misused. And now with AI, we can also expedite some of those misuses, but that's beyond the scope probably at this time. No, I think we should make it into the scope. So okay. can you give us some examples just to people to relate to these concepts that are often thrown around, but maybe sure. not uh, understood properly? Oh, I can talk about risks all day. It's so much fun. So dual use relating to biological developments, for example, there's been a lot of research now just recently on uh, a lot of the drugs and the interactions with the human body are being tested through AI systems that run, looking at what's worked in the past, what could potentially work in the future. So using machine learning that you can potentially predict. They can also then, those same algorithms could be used to predict substances that might be toxic, which leads into nano a little bit. And I'm going to jump into that if I might, yes. which is that substances at the nanoscale are really, they behave differently. So the properties of a particular substance at the regular scale, when reduced to the nanoscale can actually, so for example, silver can be really toxic and a lot of metal nanoparticles, as we're now learning, can be incredibly toxic because they can cross the blood brain barrier and then they just sit. They're undetectable, you can't remove them. And so this poses new risks. This, this is a way of thinking about, you know, we have these developments and we're using these tools. Sure, we can also cure cancer potentially. We can deal with a lot of illnesses. We can manage health much better. But the flip side of that is that we can also do a lot of other things that are not, a, that are not as savory. And so whether it's using AI to develop uh, toxic substances in new ways that might be outside the scope of other regulatory regimes like the Biological Weapons Convention, or the Chemical Weapons Convention, although I would argue that they still fall within them, there is scope for that conversation. I think it's really important that we have these conversations and we start having them now to your why now question, because this is happening now. The science, even in the last 10 years since I started writing the book, has advanced so tremendously. The ability to particularly alter the human brain is huge. So nano, you mentioned nanoscale. Can you just explain briefly what is nanoscale? I normally have this wonderful video that takes you down a rabbit hole. <laughs> nano is basically the smallest size of molecular structure that you can imagine. So uh, Vavoch meaning dwarf, nano is, is a tiny, tiny size that we can't see. It's not visible to the human eye. For those who think visually, it's about 100,000 times across a human hair. It's really looking at things on the tiniest scale of what we're all made of and what everything's made of but we didn't really know how to manipulate or use. It's always existed, nanomaterials have always existed. So they've always been in sea spray and you know, even milk droplets. You know, the, the asbestos can be in nano form, which is also why it's particularly harmful because it lodges in the lungs. But many substances have been in nanomaterial form. The new thing, and this is always the question for me, what is new? The new thing is that we can now manipulate these substances in ways that we couldn't before. We can mix these substances, we can maneuver, we can control them in ways that we couldn't before. And so the possibilities of that coupled with the toxicity that I was just talking about before really change what can be done with nanomaterials. So we still are learning, it's, there's still a lot of research going on in this area. And there are others who will be far more expert in the nanoscale side of things, the nanomaterial side of things than I am. And why would you think that nanoscale materials will be an important part of how countries define self-defense? To the point that every state is always trying to balance security and humanity, I think we're in a moment right now where we have been in a, in a heightened state of states wanting to defend themselves. And that's completely illustrated or supported by the defence budgets of, of states around the world. Every state wants the edge. They want the thing that someone else doesn't have. And if they don't have that thing, they want the thing that's going to make the other state fearful that they have the thing. So there's that. 
from a security aspect, but from a humanity aspect, there's also the, the desire to create new medicines. And a lot of this research is actually coming out of uh, a desire for medical interventions. So it's a combination, I think, of some of the serendipitous finds in the medical fields are then potentially misappropriated by or used by defence. And this is where the dual use aspect comes in. Um, and the thing that's really important is that those uses are compliant with existing law. And that's what this book really focuses on because we have laws that govern the use of these materials. And are the harms different from those of conventional weapons? Absolutely. And the time scales are different. And this is one of the challenges that the traditional laws of war were from a time where you know, a bullet went into a gun and there was a, a measurement. And even now there are very specific uh, there's a very, very good understanding and a specific approach to how weapons are evaluated. How do you evaluate something you can't see? How do you evaluate a tool that resides permanently in the human body? How do you evaluate a tool that is reversible? These are all concepts and challenges that I had to deal with in the book. So if you can potentially, and now we're almost at the point where this can happen, where you can either insert memories or alter memories, what does that even mean? What are the responsibilities that come with that? The laws of war were not really shaped at a time where this was foreseen. So this is a really difficult, the book was a difficult challenge in the sense that it was taking a lot of things from the past that had potential use and saying, Here's all these, here are all these new technologies that are coming at us really quickly. How can we apply them? And for that reason, I also tell a lot of stories because, or go through the history, when I say tell stories, the history of these negotiations because the intentions of the draft is relevant under international law, are really important to understand, even though these laws might not have been specifically written for these technologies and don't seem to have relevance, most of them do. So even though no one could have imagined a Blade Runner type world, here we are, we have these laws, they still can apply and they can be discussed and strengthened to support these new technologies is the other, the other aspect. I'll come back to the promise and peril. I just want to take one question from one of our attendees. Yeah, hi, Kevin Legrander. Um, I wonder about the political, if there's political will enough to, um, to actually regulate nanotechnology. And the reason I ask is because I was at a conference a couple of years ago where an FDA scientist talked about the harmful nanoparticles put into sunscreen that go right into the bloodstream and then travel around. I use a lot of sunscreen, so I listen hard on that. And it, it struck me that she's with the FDA and yet they were having trouble yep. regulating this. So is there really political will? If not, will it, do you see the ability to catch up you know, uh, with developments? That's a, a fantastic question. Firstly, I commend you on wearing sunscreen as an Australian. I really value that. That's a, a really important thing in life. The, the links between civilian regulation and hostile use regulation are really important. And to mention another book, uh, I co-authored a chapter on this, on the on nanomaterial side with a woman called uh, Dr. Professor, uh, Professor Bowman, looking at exactly that and saying, what's happening in the civilian sphere? How can we learn about what's happening there? It's slow, but I think to answer your question in the civilian sphere, there will be litigation and companies will have risks and they will move very quickly. And that is already happening in certain cases. But to Anya's question about, you know, what's different with nanomaterials, you need to, it depends on the, the quantity that you're using, but basically the residual aspect and the blood brain barrier transfer aspect are what are important. So once they're in your body, they're in your body and you can't remove them. At least now we, at this stage, we don't know how to. So that long-term effect is what's really interesting. And it's a little bit like, if you think of some of the other uh, litigation around other chemicals that we've seen, then you're sort of looking at that long, you know, longer term impact. I think that though that there needs to be much better communication, and this is why I contributed to this uh, collected edition that's edited by Bill Boothby, because often the movement is much faster in the civilian sphere, and people say, well, you know, there are bombs dropping and there's all this other. Stuff. Who cares about this stuff? Well, I would argue that when you have residual materials that go into water tables and into food chains and we then ingest and are in us long term, we need to think about risk and harms of war differently. And I don't think we're doing that enough, particularly as food shortages become an issue, 
if that food is then toxic, longer term, we need to think more collaboratively and more collectively about what those long term impacts are. I'm not sure if that answers your question, but it's yeah, yeah, it, you know, political will bothers me. It worries me. Um, the political will, I think, in the civilian sphere, as I say, like if a company is going to be sued, they're going to have political will <laughs> to change, and that's probably, unfortunately, it's often the litigation that brings about the change, whether it's Roundup or Teflon or you know, any number of products that we've seen that have been where it's come to light that they're really toxic to humans, the switch can be incredibly quick. The challenge, I think, will be translating that into an understanding in the policy community in wartime because they're different people and those communications are not strong enough. But that's an argument I also make that there needs to really be a strengthening. Where science is moving rapidly, policymakers in the international sphere need to get across what those risks are and they need to be understanding. So if the FDA regulates and says this is a harm, or it's known that there's a harm, shouldn't even take the FDA regularly, then policymakers need to say, is it okay to leave a battlefield toxic for the next 100 to 200 or permanently? We don't know how long these things remain. Then I think that that has to happen really very urgently and that's part of the call in the book. So thanks for asking that question. And we see already that microplastics at nanoscale is already seeping into our systems and creating damages that we really can't tell exactly what that will uh, manifest itself as exactly. long term. Yeah. And also small quantities accumulate. So food chains and microplastics are probably easier for people to visualize, but things accumulate. So it's not just the exposure once to your point about sunscreen, it's multiple exposures. So again, if you have even not necessarily nano weapons, but the we nanomaterials in weapon systems, but if you have nanomaterials in uh, waste that's produced or left in a battlefield, and that is in the water tables, longer term, Often the women and children are the ones who are in the dirt, who've left the water, the most affected. They will then over time have exposure that is toxic, so or potentially toxic. So again, these are things that we need to be talking about, thinking about very yeah. differently. And we will come back to this issue around modifying the environment and long-term consequences. But first, one more question. Yeah, um, Bill Beck. Um, I just have a question about how you differentiate or make some distinction between dual use as a notion dealing with technology specifically and the instrumentalist argument that simply says technology is just a tool right clearly we, we don't you don't necessarily have to have responsibility for development because anything that you make and it doesn't matter what it is or how you develop it can be used in multiple ways so it's really just people it, it's you know the guns don't kill people people <laughs> kill people argument so you know, it's and so but if we look at the if we look at technologies you could conflate those two if you don't make a distinction about the difference between designing and thinking about ethics in terms of the development of technologies and how they actually, how they create political um, uh, facets, right? Uh, that have impact on society. Uh, and we just start thinking of them as, as instruments rather than that. So like, is there yep. any kind of distinction that you make either in the book or, or just in your personal philosophy around this where you can kind of keep people from conflating those two? I might tell a personal story about um, I'm here in New York with my son and he was asking about all the guns and we have gun laws in Australia. We have far fewer people who are killed by guns because we have fewer guns and tighter regulations around those guns. So for starters, yes, people are at the core, but philosophically, that's, I think, I think there are two separate points that you're making. I think one is around the tools and how they're regulated. So I strongly and firmly believe that these tools need to be regulated and that's the reason for the book, which is we have all of this international law, how does it apply to these new technologies? But fundamentally and philosophically, every tool comes out of a social context. So the way that we are building these tools and the way that we are thinking about these tools always has values embedded in them, to your point. I don't think there is a neutral tool. We build tools for a purpose. So there's already an agenda, there's a political background, there's a context, and that has a lot of influence in terms of how we use the tools. In the case of nanomaterials, not all states have access. And this was another impetus for the book, was attending a conference where for three days, we sat around with numerous states uh, discussing what potential uses of technology could be. And again, nano was kind of tacked on at the end. At the end, we did around the table take home, who, was, who had learned what from the session. And one of the states said, well, I've learned that we're never going to have most of these technologies, so we're just going to go back to 
basic weapons. So again, that that unintended consequence of perhaps having more sophisticated, extremely highly developed weapons that create fear, which we've seen through you know, the use of chemical weapons and um, over the years that, that that response to weaponry is not just about who's going to die, it's also important to fear, may actually have unintended consequences that others will then respond to in kind and do different things. So what I'm, I suppose what I'm trying to say is that even though we think that these tools are neutral, just the way that we're developing them and thinking about them and using them will have societal impacts. So I don't think that they are neutral from a philosophical perspective. And when we're talking about other technologies, like, and again, this is one of the other dangers and I really struggle with this compartmentalization of the weapons, they're gonna be used together. So particularly when you're thinking about nanomaterials, if you can manipulate bodily function, we're seeing incredible advances in the use of, well, we're seeing some advances and attempts to advance the uses of machine learning and artificial intelligence. So they will be coupled. All of these technologies will be linked. And that's, I think, another danger is that we often overlook the use of the technologies together. I doubt that nanomaterials will be used individually. And one of the technologies I look at is manipulation of the human brain, which requires you know, other sort of interactions that will be coupled with other technologies. So the horse and tank moment, moment is not one technology per se, but the combinatorial capabilities um, when we put these technologies together, that's really what's going to define it. The horse and tank moment, that's self coordinated Absolutely, yeah. And, and to be more, I don't think we're being creative or um, broad-minded enough. And again, these communities sit in silos in the international community. So you've got your biological experts, you've got your chemical experts, you've got different people who work on different treaties traditionally. But we saw this just recently with the use of the drone uh, on the attack of the Russian ship. People weren't really thinking about drones as a distractor. They were thinking about them as carrying weapons. You know, thinking about these technologies in ways that are more creative because people, they will be used in ways that we're not thinking about yet and together, not just in isolation. That's one of the biggest risks, I think, in how they're being thought about at the moment, at least from a policy perspective. We're going to take another question. Hi, Kobe. Cornell Green. Great talk. If we could take this to the level of the, the, um, the individual, so we now know that we are hearing about blood chips, eventually capable of reading brain waves. Do you believe that the international human rights framework, which exists now, that it is capable of giving adequate protection at the level of the human, or do we need to be thinking about either extending existing rights or creating new rights, newer rights? Uh, for example? Again, that's a, a question I grappled with, particularly where those effects are reversible. So the laws of war are really clear where you have impacts that are permanent but where you can have and to your point you can actually read brainwaves already i went to a conference um, in arizona a few years ago uh, a conference on emerging technologies um which wendell who's here hosts and part of hosting and they showed that by using a brain implant actually showing what someone could see and that was one of the moments where i just went you know you have those moments where you just go i thought this was science fiction the technology is actually further advanced than people realize but before we get caught up in the amazing technology, I think the reversibility aspect is covered by human rights. So again, by way of analogy, there is, there is a prohibition on torture. And I would argue, and I do argue in the book, that if you are having this effect or uh, if you're having these sorts of treatment of people, then that does violate human rights. Should we strengthen or should we have new law? I don't know that we're really in a time and place where we're going to have a whole lot of new law. But what we do need to do is strengthen the law that we have and say, see this law that we've got, this applies to these new technologies and this is why. And I think the scientific communities really need to step up and be involved in talking to the policymakers to explain A, what the capabilities are and B, what the risks are. And then I think policymakers need to, to really, you know, in their regular meetings say we, which happens for most of the treaties, to say we include these technologies. This is really important that we think about these technologies. So I'm sure that answers your question, but I, as much as I would love to have, um, well, it's not true. I actually wouldn't like to have new law. One of the versions of this talk, I say, you know, does, does size really matter? And if you talk about regulating nanomaterials, it's, it's really talking about regulating little things. Like, would we have a treaty on regulating big things? 
No, so why are we talking about that for nanomaterials? What we need to do is look at the materials, look at what the prop, like every other substance and say, you know, what are the risks? What are the uses? And as the book demonstrates, the uses are so varied. So if you're genetically modifying someone, that's very, very different from enhancing, which, which, which is also possible. That's very different from changing brain function. And it's very different from sort of the hardware, the thermobarics example that I also use in my book. So different laws apply to different applications. It really depends on how, how the nanomaterials are used. But in each instance of those very disparate examples, there is clearly law. It is there already. It can be applied. Lawyers apply law all the time to new technologies. We're not in a new thing. You know, we've always had new technology. So I'd like to see more creative lawyers. Which prompts the question, because we're seeing flagrant violations of international law across all domains. And certainly when it comes to governing new technologies or the weaponization technologies, there's still a lot of terrain that hasn't been explored. Some would argue that we need new treaties, new law, because we simply haven't thought about these applications that is now, you know, this combinatorial yeah. effect that you were talking about. And others saying, no, we actually have the laws. We just need to actually implement them and find maybe ways of catering to those new applications as opposed to redefining the law. But I think the bigger issue is that we're seeing a disrespect or an unwillingness to apply with what is already there. So are we fooling ourselves to think that new treaty frameworks would even help us to, to get any further? What are your take on it? Because you, one of your core arguments in your book is that we need to dig in deeper. Yep. We need to activate, revive, make sure that the laws out there is actually being applied even to those borderline, borderline cases where we might be seeing new applications of known or, or established technologies. Absolutely. I mean, it feels a little bit facetious to be talking about in, to some people and, and some of the conversations we've been having. You know, the, the position is, well, the law is being violated all the time, so who cares about the law? And my very legal response, and I'm very conscious of that is, law gets violated all the time in the domestic context, all the time. And yet we still have domestic law, it's really important. To anyone who says they call for new law, I say, have you been through a treaty negotiation? And most of those people calling for new law have not. It takes years, it takes buy-in from parties, it takes an understanding, these are complex issues. We already have these mechanisms with the experts there who could very, very to give an example, the Chemical Weapons Convention meets regularly. They already have a list of prohibited substances. Which took almost a decade. Which took almost a decade to negotiate with the buy-in of industry, with the buy-in of a number of states already pushing for it. It was a different time. It was a different era. We're in a different time now. But what we could do is really strengthen, and it's starting to, some of those conversations are starting to happen, to say, in those meetings, we are going to clearly state that any material, any chemical, even at the nanoscale, is included. And what it might also include, back to the sunscreen question, is relying on, because it's all connected, is relying on the research in the civilian se sector to say, okay, we're not prohibiting silver. And silver is a really good example. Silver is not prohibited on the Chemical Weapons Convention. But on the nanoscale, we know it's toxic at X. Now, the devil is going to be in the how to prohibit the transportation and the use in ways that chemicals, you can say, okay, X amount and it, it is already like this, that certain chemicals are allowed in certain amounts for certain reasons, and governments have very strict regulations around this in compliance with convention. How do you do that for substances you don't see? There's going to need to be better collaboration between the civilian sector, exactly to your point, and the defence uses to say, this is what we'll tolerate. I think we might also need some creative ways to govern that are not necessarily just treaty-based, but also culture-based. We need, you know, the web of prevention, the old ICRC idea of scientists being more aware of what the risks of their works are and also being able to have whistleblower protection by saying, this is happening and I don't think this is a good idea. Or So again, it's not just one blunt instrument of law, which people love to call for more law, which just makes me want to cry because it takes forever and it's really painful. But yeah, we have a whole suite of tools available to us. We need to be more creative in thinking about those tools in preventing harm, which is ultimately what I would like to see. And I think most people in, you know, supporting the laws of war and prohibiting harm would like to see. So scientific collaboration, not just on advancing the science itself, but also to protect against the harms. 100% to, to really own those risks and to be engaged, more engaged with the policymakers, much like Hugwash, which Einstein set up as one of his last 
wishes, which brings together every year the scientists and the policymakers, not in their roles as state representatives, but as scientists, because there was such deep concern about the use of nuclear weapons. Other question? Yeah, relative to what you're just saying, uh, I'm wondering how effective you think, well, I, I do AI, AI and ethics. So, Joshua Benjo at the University of Montreal recently um, initiated what's called the Montreal uh, Declaration for mm -hmm. AI, for responsible use of AI. So anybody can sign that, it's on the web. We could all sign it 10 minutes from now. Mm -hmm. So ideally scientists will read this, sign it, and they'll sort of have a unified set of ethics for developing AI. I'm wondering, if you think that would be effective with nanotechnology as well, or if you think anything like this is even effective, um, I, I'm not so sure. That's supposed to be the scientists you know, taking um, ownership of the risk. Yeah, again, none of these solutions are sufficient. So they're necessary, but to use a computer science, and they're necessary, but not sufficient. So each of these approaches, whether we're talking about supporting the international law, improving communication between policymakers and scientists or having scientists have more awareness, they're ands, not ors. So one alone is not going to be satisfactory or be sufficient to comply with, uh, to make sure that humans are safe. But what I do think is missing is the ability for scientists to reflect. And the community of nano scientists working on nanomaterials is not enormous. This is a very specialized, highly qualified, Feel, largely, I don't think it is impossible that there is a greater awareness. And this has happened with the biologists. So biology is also quite disparate. Nano, the research of nanomaterials is also quite disparate. But to bring, that has already happened with the biological scientists where they were brought together to have these conversations. It wasn't as successful as it could have been, but it's better than it would have been had there not been those sorts of conversations where scientists then at the water cooler will say, well, what are you working on? You know, I think, have you thought about the implications of that? Where I think it gets really complicated, and this is sort of, again, going into your field or going talking about AI, is when those technologies are combined. So when, when you're using fast moving technologies to move science along, who then, you know, where are those conversations happening? Is it in the scientific community of the nanomaterials? Is it the people who are building the algorithms? Because they don't necessarily understand the implications. Of, and again, it's siloing mm. where we need to be I think there needs to be much better communication about the risk. And the point that I make in the book is that not only do we need to review weapons at the point of purchase or modification, with very specific circumstances, there also needs to be under Article 82, the ability to provide information in the battlefield. How do you do that? I mean, this was traditionally done by lawyers. Lawyers don't understand how these things work. So Article 82 in the Geneva. The Geneva Convention. Yes, thank you. Yes. So just to make sure that our listeners yes. are following the arguments here. So, that makes it really clear that there's a responsibility to tell commanders, you know, this is the risk of this. Again, if you have a gun and a bullet, it's quite simple. This is going to cause this harm. It's really complicated now. And we just, we're not really looking forward enough to how we minimize those risks, not just before use, but also during use, I think. And we don't have the relevant expertise. We don't have people who can translate across those areas. And this goes for all technology. So it's, it does tie in a little bit to also you know, the autonomous weapons debate. I think, again, there's law. How we do it is, again, the devil's in the detail. And the verification part of it, because you do speak a lot about implementation, enforcement, verification in your book. That sometimes the difficulty is not that we lack the frameworks, but that we lack, to the point that was raised about political will, the political will, but sometimes also, also the skill sets and even Absolutely. the technologies that could actually help us to do that verification in meaningful ways, especially when you're talking about weaponization of technologies at a nanoscale, the technologies uh, that essentially requires you to have a very deep insight into software, to algorithmic um, processes, et cetera. And you and I wrote an article not so long ago about the seven myths of human control mm -hmm. uh, and how our illusion that putting a human in the loop, you know, to ensure that that um, oversight, you know, needs to be looked at and to be addressed and to be fully understood. But can you speak more about the enforcement, compliance, oversight uh, angle to all of this? Yeah, I think, I think there are a lot of things when A, not talking about to your peer for those gaps, but B, we're also not looking again at the complexity. Having looked at, in one of my roles, I looked at government's compliance with 
um, the Chemical Weapons Convention, the Biological Weapons Convention. To comply with the Chemical Weapons Convention requires numerous pieces of legislation. So it's import-export controls, it's policing, it's you know, scientific development. There are all of these different angles. But how those substances, and this is before we get to nano, so I'm just starting with you know, basic weapons control. Before you get to that, or once you have those regulations, how you actually enforce them matters. So you can have all of those regulations, but if you don't ensure compliance and use, you know, review the import and export of these materials, it's not really going to help. The other bit that I more recently have become aware of is also who finances this. It's not necessarily states anymore. It's who's moving what around. You can track that through other methods. What is being tracked? How is it being tracked? How is compliance being followed up? Is a huge question and although a lot of states have signed on to these various treaties they don't necessarily have the compliance mechanisms that they should have or the, the will the political will to your point or the capacity for smaller states it's an enormous undertaking now add to that the next layer which is you can't see this stuff right and so we're now talking about materials that you don't really you can't access or have oversight over so there's just that added layer to the already complex um i would say not 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 regulated even if the regulations are there, the compliance, the culture of compliance, because culture plays a huge role in all of this, is not necessarily there. And again, that's something that, that needs to be thought about. And how would you do that in practice, in your view? Oh, I can't fix it all. <laughs> <laughs> I think almost every answer comes down to funding. There needs to be more money to actually ensure compliance, but there also needs to be training of the scientists. I would like to see more awareness to the point of the culture between the scientists, that web of prevention is the toolbox, if you like, of the things that we could use. We really need to, to connect and enable people to have conversations across disciplines. All of that requires money and will. It's And do you think the fast growing defense industrial complex, you know, where is the place for that to happen? No, is is <laughs> challenging some of these um, yeah. you know means of providing the right level of oversight. I mean a complex that is growing not just to include the the classical defense companies, but where what is regarded as part of the defense ecosystem is widening by the day, given these developments in, in technology. So there's a center here in the US that develops nanomaterials for defense, and you can't actually access it unless you have security clearance. We don't, I didn't do that, and I don't know what's happening there. How can you review or have any kind of oversight? But even outside of those particular centers, universities in engineering, computer science, any of the sciences are now largely funded or have enormous input from defense. And this is another point that I raised. When do you, again, you have a gun, you have a bullet, you put the bullet in the gun, there's a point in time where you are clearly going to use a weapon, but it's much more subtle when it comes to scientific research. So if you're developing to the point of the enzyme again, the, you know, the enzyme that can stop uh, the material that can stop enzymes in the body from functioning, which can result in death, you know, at what point is that scientist engaging in creating a weapon? At what point do you say, does there need to be a review of this substance? These are all questions that I think we're also not answering. And in addition, just because something happens in a university doesn't mean that it's not defence related, to your point. A lot of this work is defence related. It appears innocuous, it appears to be pure scientific research. But by the time it's developed, it's almost too late. It's then, you know, so much has been invested in its use and particularly when we're talking about complex systems, again, when we're talking about intervention or use of different types of technologies together in ways that you know, and are being explored in some fairly sinister ways, I think we need to be having those conversations earlier and really thinking more, I don't think ethics boards in universities have a clue in terms of how some of these things are being developed and how they'll be used. And I'm not sure they'd approve them if they knew, I don't know. We'll come back to the ethics issue in a bit. Just yeah. wanted to shift your focus, and we're going to take some more questions to a uh, topic that I know is very near and dear to your heart, which is that of webinars and involvement. Um, and you've been doing a lot of work on looking at the NMOD treaty, uh, the Environment Modification Treaty that was adopted back in the 70s to avoid the weaponization of the environment. And this goes to your short, long term impact. Yeah comment that you were making earlier. Can you explain to our listeners the importance of thinking about the environmental angle? You know, it's of course, environment is on top and center of everything we talk about these days. It's a real concern, but it's even a big concern when you're thinking about how this can be maliciously or intentionally used to 
change the, the strategic map, if you may. Yep. And also why now is a very important time, is an important time to uh, revive and mod. So the Environmental Modification Treaty, for those who don't know, came about after the Vietnam War, after widespread usage of um, Agent Orange. And it hasn't really been- Which was a herbicide, weaponized. Which, which was a weaponized herbicide. And there are a number of aspects to your question that I want to tap on into, but just to give a bit of context. The, at the time, it was the concept behind, it, and I go into this a little bit, you know, the, the framing of why and how this treaty came about is really relevant because it was really looking at if, uh, to your point, an intentional harm to the environment was caused, there should be some kind of culpability. I would raise this and I go further to say, well, I don't think it's any more about the intent. And we have to be really careful about and intent is incredibly hard to prove, firstly. And particularly when you're talking about new sciences and new materials, the risks of which are not fully understood. So it's very easy, it would be very easy for a state or a commander to say, well, I just didn't know or I wasn't aware, which may be the case. So I think the intent part of it is problematic, but I think what's in that treaty are the bones of the ability, again, to open up the conversation. It is a treaty that exists already. It is a treaty that I was quite surprised to find has lain dormant. I don't think the states have met for nearly two decades. Since mid nineties. Mid nineties, it's a, that's a long time ago. Uh, we really need to have these conversations, but the context as well was when I first raised this 10 years ago, I, I was told you really think that you know, the environment is that big a deal. So I know for some of us, the environment is front and center, but for a lot of people, for some people, it's still not. And then over time, as I was working on the book, obviously we had the bushfires in Australia and we've now had the floods and more recently, but those natural events I think have, have crystallized or coagulated for people that there is, at least in the, you know, where I live, there is there are real risks. And whatever you intend and whatever the scale, and this is the issue with um, the current framing is that there needs to be wide, long widespread, long-lasting or severe impacts. Those are time, and they've got a quite a short time frame. We have a different world now. We have science that can cause long-term harm cumulatively. Should we only be looking at those risks? And I would argue very strongly no. So again, I think states really need to think about if you leave a country long-term after a conflict in a way that no food can be grown safely and no water can be drunk safely, over a longer term, that is a risk that should also be captured by the laws of war. But even the immediate effects, like if you actually Absolutely. Manipulate, that, if you're manipulating yeah. access to water, 100%. the environment. Um... 100%. The risks, the risks in the immediate term also need to be reinforced, but I think the longer term needs to be explored as a greater risk, which is not being considered. So it's an, again, it's an and, not an all. Mm. Yeah. So another question? Under Wallet. Kobe, over the years, as I've listened to these conversations and participated in them, there's a point where somebody comes in and says, what you've just described is overwhelming. The complexity is daunting. We're not only talking about having to look at specific nanotechnologies, but also we have a problem with bio, we have the synergies between the technologies. There's not the will to work on the treaties to restrict the deployment of these technologies. There's not necessarily even the will or the funding to put in place the complex infrastructure to even put in appropriate oversight. And of course, now we have this context where we're seeing rash violations of international, yeah. uh, international laws with great impunity. I mean, one day you you pass a no cluster bomb treaty and the next day cluster bombs are, are being deployed. So I hear over and over again, why should I be anything other than pessimistic? Are you doing anything more here than waving a cautionary flag, if not a flashing red um, you know, Doppler signal or something like that? What is it that gives you hope or what actual first steps do you think would lay foundations that, this, that people can be hopeful or trust that they're actually putting in place a regime that's going to make a difference? Well, I think if I didn't have hope, I wouldn't have written the book. <laughs> I was gotten under the duvet and 
got not gotten up. I mean, I think throughout history, there have been times where the appetite for disarmament and weapons control or for finding solutions to any complex problem have waxed and waned. And right now we are in a waning moment. Um, I think that generations forget what's happened before. And we are currently in a moment where it's very easy to forget. I think as long as we sort of had the horrors of some of the other wars, there was a, a greater understanding of the value of some of these laws. I don't have all the answers. What gives me hope though, is that there are enough people in these communities who do care and who are informed to actually kickstart this conversation. I think the bigger challenge for me is how do we keep these, these new technologies that are complex and overwhelming relevant in the, and I think this might be maybe going to the heart of your question in the core, in the face of core violations of basic principles with basic weapons. So sort of who cares about the new stuff when we have all these old weapons that are, you know, if you drop a conventional weapon on a hospital or a school, why are we talking about nano? Again, I don't, I don't think it's an either or, and this is part of the reason that I really wanted to put something in writing that, that, that holds that we should be complying with. And again, I think this is a moment right now. It's the flagrant violations we are seeing are horrendous, but we can't lose sight of the other issues that are still on the horizon because they will come, become more and more prevalent. Those, these new and emergent and now currently technologies that are, haven't been used on the battlefield yet, we will see on the battlefield. And when that happens, I want something in writing that says it's covered by international law. I don't want people to be sitting there going, we need new law because we don't, we have. So that's the hope, I suppose, is that there have been treaties negotiated over decades in the past that carry a lot of weight. And treaties are not some kind of dead instrument as those who've worked in negotiations. No, they're live things that involve relationships and communities and people who care. And I think probably the biggest answer is I see people who care. And as long as there are people who care, who care there is hope. What's the alternative? I mean, for me, I can't not try. Um, but these projects are also hard. Getting across the science was hard. It would have been much easier to just say oh, nanomaterials, which is what had happened sort of up until yeah. this project. It was always, and the same with to a certain extent with quantum, I think there are still other gaps that need to be filled where people need to come in and say, you know, where is the technology? Where is it going to be? What are the real risks? How does this really change something? We do need to have more forward thinking sort of lines in the sand to say, look, when you get here and this is developed, not with this tool. No, you don't. We have the law. Yeah. Thanks. That's a great Another question. question? <laughs> That's What's, what's your feeling and what's your experience in so far as the bringing together of the scientific community and their recommendations and their attempt to explain the potential risks, long-term, short-term, complex, mm -hmm. uh, et cetera, to the diplomatic community with people with a, a very different set of background, educational trajectories, all of those types of things. So you have very different uh, groups of people with different pedigrees, different interests, uh, and different um, uh, obligations professionally um, coming together. When we're talking about something that's scientific, now as you mentioned previously, there's a gun, there's a bullet, you put it in. Well, you know, you can imagine that anybody with a basic rational mind can understand the, the outcomes. But when you start to talk about, you know, percentages, statistical significance of, you know, nanomaterials that are of a particular type of molecular mm -hmm. structure, et cetera, you can quickly lose people who are just one field over, mm -hmm. but also scientists. So how do you, how, what was your experience in this in terms of like when these two groups of people meet, how, how does it go, right? How does, the, how does the information transfer go? And is there, is there a space for hope there? Or is that something that needs a tremendous amount of work and is, or what type of opportunities might be? I love that question. I have spent nearly all of my career as either the only or one or two women in the room or the only person who's not of the major group. So I think I've specialised in being an outsider. So as a legally trained person who wrote a paper on dictatorships and humour in Germany in the fall of the wall, I then ended up working with scientists 
on the biological and chemical weapons convention compliance side, I've always had this desire, and I think there are generalists, other generalists like me who need to be given greater voice and greater roles to translate. I translate all the time. I sit in rooms where I, I, I use words that are really not the complex academic words, although I can use those, but I, what's important to me is that translational work between cultures. And the differences are, are, are huge in some aspects, the differences between whether you've done a science degree or a law degree, or a, you know, we, we're all shaped by our original form of study for those of us who have the privilege of studying, which not everyone does. And a lot of the people, a lot of the work also needs to be done with people who don't have degrees. So again, it's making this sort of information accessible, but I think that work can be done and it needs to be done and it needs to be prioritized. So more recently, I was, again, the only lawyer in two computer science and engineering schools saying, do you know there are risks to what you're building? Do you know, you know, having those conversations takes time. Building culture takes time, but it doesn't mean we can't do it. And I think education has to change. The way that we engage has to change. Policymakers need to listen, but scientists also need to be more accessible and need to be able to translate their work. We need to be making... And I had this argument very directly in the academic circles I was in where I was told I needed to use more academic words. I was told, <laughs> I was told this to my face. I did a mapping project for Cyber in Australia and I was told you need to use more academic words. I was also told that I needed to, uh, that mapping was not an academic project. My book is a map. My book is a map of what exists to find where the gaps are. And every time I see a problem, maybe it's just the way that my brain works, but when I see a problem, I want to know what exists already before I go in and go, I need new law, we need new law. What exists now? What is missing? What is new? These are, this, is, this is a process, an approach. We need to be less snobby. We need to, to let more people in the room. And I think to the point of pugwash, which I raised earlier, I think we need more scientists who are engaged in policy making, who understand. And that comes back to issues of conflicted interest, issues of funding. You know, we need to have those resources to issues ensure of scientific methods. Issues of scientific methods across even within computer science, let alone between the different disciplines. So when you're adding AI to nanomaterials or AI to chemicals or you know, any of these sorts of connections, we need to be doing much, much more of the translation work and be a little bit more humble about the language we use and let more people in. This is a great segue some applause there. This is a great segue to, because you know, you have a whole career other than writing about the weaponization of new technologies. I'm not sure what law. career I have anymore. <laughs> I just do things, yeah. Um, and uh, you have, as you did to yourself just now, you worked in engineering school, you work with computer scientists, you're regarded as one of, you know, one global expert on issues of how do we manage data responsibly? How do we develop science responsibly? How do we develop AI responsibly? And the ethical considerations that often gets forgotten. Like, what have you seen in this line of work? You've been really pushing some, some new boundaries and, and barriers you know, on rethinking how we think about computer science per se, the power that is held by the engineers and the computer scientists, um, and, but also you know, how we are embedding these technologies. We started off talking about, you know, is, can technology ever be neutral? You have been a very strong advocate to saying, the minute is embedded, no. You know, you may think that at the development stages, and even there you have to question it, you know, because from the very conception, you know, you are embedding values and historical patterns, mm -hmm. economic considerations, and like you said, some of the other issues in terms of funds and where the grants, I mean, the grant management side of it. So what are you thinking on it? What are the big issues and hurdles we're facing right now? And do we have the right type of scientific discourse, um, an open enough scientific discourse to be addressing that? <sighs> It's a big question. A I know. You can go in any one direction at this time. <laughs> I really don't have all the answers is what I'm going to start by saying. I just see problems and I keep poking at them. I, I see things that are problems and I write about and talk about them. For those who have any doubt that technology is neutral, um, Langdon Winner is one of my favourite authors where he writes about you know, the physical structures so that you know, the bus overpasses here in New York were built really low to keep the high-rise buses out because certain people took them and they didn't want them coming into New York right we have certain energy structures and certain physical structures that shape the world that we have I think what we're missing what I think about a lot is not 
thinking about critiquing or saving the world we have, I think what we've lost the ability to do is what Julie Asanoff talks about as socio-technical imaginaries. We're not imagining the world we want. We build these tools, we make these tools, we decide how these tools are used. We set limits on these tools. We as humans to the point about, is it guns who kill people or people who kill people? Well, it's people who do the research and it's people who write the policy. And I for one would really like to see a world where we are having more direct and thoughtful conversations about what we actually want to be achieving and for whom. Who, is, who are these developments benefiting? And not in a naive kind of, I'd like to sit down and you know, have a little think. I said to in my recent job interview, I really don't want to do fluffy bunny ethics. And I thought that probably shouldn't have been said in a job interview, but they hired me anyway. <laughs> it has to be practical. There has to be granular. There has to be decision-making and ownership over these tools, whoever makes and builds any of these tools. And that includes the technologies that we're seeing that are shaping our society in ways that are far beyond what we even understand yet. We need to be holding to account and also calling for change. And do you feel that this is well understood by computer scientists and people working on the development of new technologies, be that on nanoscale or in bio or in chem or in other fields? Absolutely not. So computer scientists, the most regular response I had working with computer scientists, and again, computer scientists isn't overreached. Computer scientists fall into multiple different communities. Those communities, again, have different cultures. And there's a piece of research uh, that I worked on looking at the hypothesis that the more diversity you have in a group, the more interesting thought you have and the more responsibility. So again, coming back to AI, a lot of the people calling for change and limitations are sort of outsiders to those communities. And people in the communities, but a lot of women, the more diversity you have, the more risk management you have. So we also, this comes back, it's all tied in again, the more diversity you have, the more you let other people into the group, the more you're gonna have people raising these issues. But computer scientists, are not it's, ethics is often touched upon lightly in their training, but it's not how they think. When I, I always joke and say, ethics is not binary, right? Computer programming is. And so the desire to sort of code ethics somehow, you know, it, 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 there are things that are human, that are in, innately and uniquely human. And I do not think all things can be automated. We can't code all human facets. No. And you now spoke about the computer scientists, now going to the policy side, which you've also been part of for a long time. Do we have the right level of understanding on the policy side of the intricacies that some of these technologies, especially the combinatorial effect, um, has? I wasn't thinking I was going to quote Ted Lasso in this talk, but I think I'm going to have to. <laughs> I, have to. I think the issue, the issue, I mean, there were different cultures in different groups, but from the policy side, and this, I say this as a, a legally trained person, you can't be arrogant and curious at the same time. You have to be able to sit in a place of not knowing. And every day that I go to work, I don't know things. I ask dumb questions. And I think when you have people who come through a particular line of training where their entire careers, you know, policymakers are often in very prestigious roles and they don't want to ask questions that make them look stupid. We have to all ask questions that make us look stupid because nobody understands what's going on right now. Nobody understands enough or all of it or has questions that ask you. I mean, we just need to be more, humble. again, it comes back to a sort of a way of engaging with the world of asking more questions of being more curious. And you know, it's hard. Policymakers need to have a certain interaction or way of engaging. But again, I think that's, it comes back to that culture. If you can build up a culture where there are relationships between the scientists and the policymakers and people feel safe enough to ask questions, I think all of that takes investment and time. And you alluded to earlier, you mentioned Pierre Bourdieu, you know, the gaps, the, the dogmas. And, uh, and I'm, you and I have spoken about this before. It was then repeated in some of Gillian Tett's work, you know, speaking about social science that was built on Bourdieu's work, you know, issues that are, purposely kept mm -hmm. out of the public discourse, out of the public domain, because there mm -hmm. are issues that drive some of the more political uh, movements we see in society. What do you think is my last question to you? What are the social silences that we should be mindful of? In relation to nano or more broadly? In relation to emerging technologies more broadly, but I think maybe with a specific focus, both on nano, um, the environment and AI. So three different domains, but I think some of the social silences bizarrely and maybe naturally coincide. 
think there's one word that we don't talk about enough, and that word is power. And all of those areas are being funded, areas of research are being funded for certain groups, for certain reasons of interest. And so when I say power, what I mean is we started out talking about, to use AI again as an example, we started talking about the ethics of AI. I think that conversation is shifting, the ethics are still relevant, but what we're, what we're ultimately talking about is power. Who is funding what to what purpose? And not all groups have equal access. I don't think you can have any kind of equitable world without more diversity in the room, having a conversation saying, this is how it affects me. A lot of these tools are being used being developed and used by particular groups for particular purposes. Again, none of this is new. This is not some 2022 thing. But what's different is that the amount of money that's crystallized is so enormous. And those people have very specific views. And one of them is that you know, if the rich people survive through climate change and propagate into the future, that's better than saving all the planet now. Well, I fundamentally disagree. We actually have an obligation to look after this planet, these people, and I don't think just saving the rich should be the goal of any of the work that we do. But again, a lot of this comes down to how do you reflect those values? How do you build those communities? How do you have these safeguards? It requires funding. So there's this inherent tension in there. That's a conversation I think we need to be having. To tackle those inherent tensions, which is also the core of ethics and the core of the work of the Carnegie Council in trying to re-envision ethics for the information age. Thank you so much, Kobe, for this great Thank talk. Thank you so much for having Thank me. Thank you Thanks for great everyone. questions.